Hello everybody, we're out here at Valley Farm today, which is part of the Spring Green campus near Spring Green, Wisconsin, and I'm here with Scott Brainerd. Scott, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, I'm. Uh, my name's Scott, I'm a tree crop breeder with Savannah Institute, and today we're planting hazelnuts, which is one of the crops, one of the main crops that we're working on and trying to develop new improved varieties of. This is a pretty exciting day. I've been working on creating these plants for the last uh, basically two full years now and a lot of partners that have helped help make all of these crosses and grow out all the seed and now we get to plant about 15 acres. Scott, can you tell us a little bit about what's been happening here yesterday and today? So we've got I don't know, like at least half a dozen people here. <laughs> yeah. There's a lot going on. Yeah, so um, so this is a new uh, farm for Savannah Institute, and this is the first uh, plant material that we're actually putting in the ground here. Okay. We're right next to the Spring Green Preserve, so it's a beautiful location. This is also a very uniform field. It's, it's very flat and has a uniform kind of ideal soil type for growing hazelnuts, a nice uh, sandy loam. And so what we're doing is this field uh, is kind of broken up into quadrants. Um, this part of this field at least is about 80 acres and we're planting one of those quadrants to about 1700 hazelnuts. Um, and so you can see all of these uh, potted potted hazelnuts that, are, that were descended from seed that was produced in 2020. Mm -hmm. So we made controlled crosses and by we I mean the uh, University of Minnesota, one of our partners on this project, made uh -huh. uh, controlled crosses and then we took that seed and stratified it, grew it out into pots and we're now putting these in the ground. So we've got uh, Canopy Farm Management helping us with the planting so they were very kind to drive their fancy GPS guided tractor in perfectly straight lines and help us um, flag out all of these plants so that everything is going in at a uniform spacing and a pretty wide spacing mm -hmm. for Midwest hazelnuts. Um, and the, the reason for that is that we're hoping that these plants will be able to evaluate on a sort of individual plant basis for the next 10 to 15 years. Uh -huh. um, the kind of overarching goal of this site is to try to find improve new new hazelnut plants that could be uh, that could become a new variety. So these are all genetically unique plants. They're all um, seedling varieties essentially, and so every one of these is going to turn into a different looking bush with uh, you know different yield, different size kernel. And so for the next decade or so, the idea is to study these bushes and uh, try to find the next great hazelnut. Scott, you were saying that this is a pretty unique thing that's happening here today. Yeah, I think uh, in terms of the scale of this planting, uh, you know, actually being planted to hazelnuts is just over 14 acres. Um, like I said, a, a, about 1,700 plants that are going in the ground all of them genetically unique with a few uh, clonal varieties interspersed as checks just to um, be able to see variability throughout the field. Uh -huh. um, and yeah, in terms of the upper Midwest, nobody has really, uh, ha has really done a, a planting like this before. These are all um, what we call full sibs or F1. So every plant is descended from a uh, specific mother and a specific father that we actually know. Um, so these are a series of full sib families. So you have the pedigree for every one of these trees? We have the pedigree for all of these trees and specifically the parents for most of these trees are previously identified high performing bushes that, that do really well in the upper Midwest. Okay. So the kind of history to this planting is for the last 15 years uh, folks at UW and University of Minnesota have been uh, going out into farmers' fields, finding those those top performing bushes, putting them into replicated trials, and um, in those replicated trials, finding the best 12 to 15 um, 
varieties that, that they are now clonally propagating. And all of these plants are crosses between those top performing varieties. Okay. And so that's, that's sort of what makes this unique is um, this is the first time that we've known enough about the parents to really pick top performing bushes and then um, and, and, sort of, and make those full sieve families. And then in terms of the scale at which we're planting these out, um, you know, this is really because of generous donations that have been made to Savannah Institute in terms of land. So having access to a really uniform research site like this is a pretty unique resource. Um, and then just having all of these partners come together. So University of Wisconsin, Minnesota, Savannah Institute, Canopy Farm Management, to all help in not just the planting, but now, you know, the next over a decade worth of management and research here. Um, this is going to be a, a, you know, a very unique resource and hopefully one that all of these partner organizations can use. So hopefully a, a bit of a community resource for um, folks who are interested in, in studying hazelnuts, but also studying you know, all sorts of experiments that you can sort of overlay on top of a large hazelnut field like this. Great. As you can see in the video, this, uh, the Valley Farm here in Spring Green, Wisconsin, looks different than any of the other farms here on the Spring Green campus. It's very flat. Yeah. I mean, it's right near the, I don't know where the Wisconsin River is, but it's clearly it's, part of the river yep. valley. Yeah, so this is Spring Green kind of just behind us, and, and right behind Spring Green is the Wisconsin River. Um, so we're in the Wisconsin River Valley here. Um, just in front of us is the, the bluff of the Spring Green Preserve. And yeah, the, sort, the rest of the Spring Green campus farms are nestled up into valleys on, on either side of this, of this river valley. And so they have a lot more topography to them, a lot more variability in um, so slope, soil type, and you know, they are themselves m more diverse in terms of having both wooded acreage and then tillable acreage. Um, so this farm is pretty unique in, in just how uniform it is. So it may not necessarily be perfectly representative of, um, you know, every farmer who's interested in agroforestry and the driftless, but it's ideal for doing research for that reason. Mm -hmm. Like I was saying, every one of these bushes is genetically unique. There's a few clones uh, sort of sprinkled throughout here, but when you're growing uh, just one copy of a single genotype, it's really important to try to make the environment that all of these plants are growing in as uniform as possible. Um, and that minimizes it. So when we see differences between the plants, we want to, as much as possible, be able to attribute that to genetic differences between the plants and not, you know, this plant happened to be growing on uh, you know, maybe where a deer died and that plant is growing <laughs> on a, like a buried barn from the 1800s. Right. And there is a buried barn over there that we're avoiding. <laughs> but so aside from the buried barn, this field is pretty, is pretty uniform. And, uh, and that, and that allows us to do what I was just saying, which is, um, attribute more of the variability between these plants to their genetics and feel relatively confident that we're not seeing differences that are just a function of, you know, um, this whole planting, for instance, being on a slope or having, you know, like a, a wet spot in the middle of it where roots wouldn't do too well. So uh, on, on some of the other farms, we're planting more uh, at scale uh, um, commercial acreage. So we're taking large populations of clones and growing those out as a sort of pilot plantings to show what the current clonal germplasm can do uh, when grown on a kind of commercial scale. So those plants will be planted closer together, but also, you know, on more of a rolling topography. And that's, that's great and sort of ideal for testing this out in a kind of a, testing those clones out in a more of a real world scenario. Um, but for, yeah, again, for doing genetic and breeding research, having access to, uh, to a farm like this is, is really, really key. And um, that's another kind of unique, unique resource that we've, we've just gotten access to. So it's exciting. Yeah, yeah so, uh, so some of the key traits that we're looking at here, in addition to just uh, kernel traits and um, 
the size and shape of the bush is is the yield of these bushes and yield is probably one of the most important traits across all crop species and hazelnuts is no exception it's been a really difficult trait to measure historically just because the bushes have been that we've been evaluating have been packed into to high density hedgerows on farmers fields so here we have the kind of luxury to space these bushes out and see how they actually perform um, when they're not competing with each other uh, but we'll also be looking at traits like machine harvestability. So that's how well the clusters detach from the bush, but also relates to the overall shape of the bush. You know, we want something that isn't going to be so tall we can't drive a harvester over it, but also doesn't droop so much that we can't um, sort of scoop those branches off of the orchard floor in order to get the nuts off. Because one of the interesting things about Midwestern hazelnuts is that they don't uh, the clusters don't open up at maturity and release the the nuts. Mm -hmm. In Oregon and other places where they grow hazelnuts, that is the case, and they just sweep them up off the orchard floor. Here, we actually have to get them off the bush. So machine harvestability is a really key trait that people are just now, as we sort of develop harvesters, realizing is something we should be including in the breeding. Uh -huh. And so machine harvestability, um, overall kernel quality, and yield are some of the really key traits. Um, other things we'll be keeping an eye on are resistance to eastern filbert blight, which all of these bushes come from breeding programs that have already screened pretty extensively for that and include a lot of American hazelnut in their background, which is a native shrub that is resistant to or at least tolerant of eastern filbert blight. So we're not too worried about that, but we do want to um, you know, continue to monitor for that because that would be a really devastating thing to release a variety to farmers and then find out 10 years later that it's susceptible. And we do have some plantings at the other end of the field that are crosses with pollen from Rutgers University. Um, and so that material is a little bit more uh, European hazelnut dominant. And they've been doing a lot of screening for eastern filbert blight resistance, but it's definitely something that we'll, we'll keep an eye on. Okay. Yeah. So it sounds like you're saying that um, what's going to be happening here on this farm is going to be very research focused and that what people will see here is not necessarily what someone would want to do in terms of having a profitable hazelnut production. Exactly. Yeah. So this is not what a hazelnut farm in the Midwest would ever look like. Um, the plants are very, very far apart, but also, as I was saying, they're all genetically unique and that when you actually go and plant a hazelnut farm, um, ideally what you'll be planting are uh, clones or copies of some of the top performing bushes from this field. So we'll do the work of figuring out which ones those are and then send those off to be propagated um, on a large scale. And the other thing that we'll be able to do here is um, by combining genetic sequence data with the phenotypic data that we'll be gathering by measuring all of those traits that I was just mentioning, we'll be able to make predictions about which plants we should cross together to generate the next round of seedlings. So uh -huh. this is sort of the first attempt that we're taking as an institute to develop a kind of ongoing crop improvement program for some of the key agroforestry species. So this part of this field is obviously all hazelnuts, but eventually we hope to plant different, what we're calling germplasm repositories throughout this uh, entire 80 acres and have, you know, a number of other shrub crops represented, black currant, elderberry, um, but also some tree species like persimmon and black locust and um, be able to create a sort of ongoing pipeline where we're able to both develop new varieties but also that are just improved in and of themselves but once these industries start taking off and farmers are growing a lot of hazelnuts there will be new issues that come up you know new pests that move into the area and so by having these breeding resources already in the ground we'll hopefully be able to sort of stay ahead of those uh, sort of emerging needs on the part of farmers yeah. And you know, this is what all crops, all you know, established crops have, right? They have yeah. ongoing breeding programs that 
are constantly working to respond to new challenges that farmers are facing. And that's a real outstanding need in the agroforestry world, is the development of those resources that can support on a sort of ongoing basis um, an industry. So that's yeah. what we're hoping to do with hazelnuts here, but then eventually, hopefully, a, a number of other species. Great. And that seems like something that we at the Savannah Institute can do is kind of take on some of that risk and some of that uncertainty of yeah. you know, not knowing what these trees are going to be like in 10 years. Exactly, yeah. I mean, historically, with a lot of these understudied agroforestry species, that's all fallen onto farmers' shoulders. And so all of the, re you know, most of what we're able to use here and have access to is a product of what, you know, pioneer agroforesters have developed. And, you know, the universities and certainly Savannah Institute are relatively late to the game in terms of um, starting this kind of crop improvement work. Uh -huh. But I think, I mean, from my perspective at least, uh, it's critical to have farmers involved, but that's a huge burden to put on farmers who are also trying to make a living growing these crops. Mm -hmm. And if we can step in and devote, you know, this kind of acreage and this kind of resources to crop improvement in a sort of directed way and not have to worry about also, you know, this entire acreage being a prof profitable hazelnut farm, but being specifically focused on research, I think that that would be, you know, that, that could be a really um, unique benefit that, um, right, as a nonprofit organization, we can take on those kinds of risks, those kinds of long-term costs and, uh, you know, hopefully do it in a way that, you know, a farmer just probably would never be able to finance. Um, right. So yeah, hopefully we're, we're able to do that. Yeah. And so this has been a big part of your PhD work, right? Uh, yeah, actually I started working on this while I was uh, doing my PhD at the University of Wisconsin. And uh, after I graduated, I continued working on this. So I'm now both a tree crop breeder at Svan Institute and also a postdoc in Professor Julie Dawson's lab at University of Wisconsin. And so this project is is not just a and is a is a real collaboration, and not just between Svan Institute and um, Julie Dawson's lab, but also uh, other university partners. So Jason Fishbach with University of Wisconsin Extension, and uh, Lois Braun at University of Minnesota. Um, they've all been instrumental in supporting hazelnut improvement work in the Upper Midwest, and then specifically in helping with um, the, the development of these particular plants and growing them out and uh, getting them ready to put in the field here. So this is all possible because a lot of people have, have put their um, resources together to make this happen.